these concerns for me were greater in 2008. I thought we're in, how do we recover from this? And I mean, yeah, we did a lot of crazy patchwork and there was some serious re ramifications and repercussions. And we've been hearing about this global collapse for a long time. And we're, I think what we're seeing is we're going to move more digital from digital wallets that, you know, maybe universal basic income comes in or digital wallets mm -hmm. where we see places right now not taking cash, right? That we might become cashless and everything's kind of, mm -hmm. which I think tends to give credibility to crypto, which one I couldn't tell you for sure. Yeah. Right. Um, but I think that we have to really start looking at how do we acquire assets? assets have a chance to appreciate in value where monetary systems, I think, are going to be devalued over the next several years. Money can be complicated. Let a nerd help you. We're here to demystify the complex nature of money by getting you answers from financial nerds and whiz kids. Welcome to Ask the Money Nerds, a weekly segment of the Wealth Labs podcast where we answer your most pressing money questions. Are you worried about the stability of your financial institutions? How about the monetary system overall and the dollar if you're in the United States or using it from whatever country you're at. What should you do with that kind of money that you've got sitting around or you're not sure what's going to happen? And are you at risk, especially when it comes to like people that have cash value insurance? Is there, are there going to be problems there? Let's start to unveil what's happening here, Stolba, and help people out because this is a genuine concern and, you know, something that I was just talking to Matt, our CMO about for quite a while yesterday. So it's mm -hmm. good timing. Yeah, we have, um, we're going to combine two questions into one today. Um, and they're both in regards to what do we do in the face of uncertainty, especially right. in our financial system. But I'm curious, do you have any habits or rhythms in your life when you're faced with uncertainty that help you stay centered and grounded and kind of clear stress from your life? Yeah, a couple of things that I do. One is I definitely call people that I look up to or that I would at least consider like a peer and just tell them what's going on mm -hmm. so that I'm not stuck in my own thoughts and remunerating those thoughts and worry. Yes. Um, second is I like to do my morning rituals, right? Mm -hmm. Which is everything from writing in my five minute journal, some gratitude and uh, listening to something inspirational and doing a little bit of a workout. And mm -hmm. a lot of times I'll, I'll pull out like my notebook or my productivity journal and start really planning out what's happening in the day because that way I'm not going to be derailed and distracted when these things are going on. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see anything else. Yes, yeah, so I'll reach out to someone. Um, and then the last piece is if I can add value to someone's life, who mm -hmm. can I call and add value? So I'm not just feeling like a victim or I'm mm -hmm. not just talking about woe is me, you know, and look, one thing I think is crazy about today's time, mm -hmm. people feel guilty for talking about their problems if they have a good life overall. Like somehow that if you have a nice home mm -hmm. or drive a nice car or have money in the bank, that you're not allowed to feel things. Right. That somehow it's less significant because other people have been through more treacherous stuff. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the things is things happen to us as kids and we don't know the difference. It's all threshold, right? right? It all, whether it's someone taking a toy away from you or when I was three years old and got hit by a car, they're both pretty dramatic you know, um, to a child. Yes. And, and so I think it's important to have good people you can talk to that don't exacerbate the problem. Mm -hmm. They don't just tell you it's not your fault and, you know, screw these other people, but they go, yeah. well, what could you do about it? And mm -hmm. what can you learn from this? And what, what's the next steps? And they kind of yeah. ask you those profound questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I found that to be helpful in my life too. There's something about, you know, we like to almost categorize pain and trauma. Like this one's far superior than this one. But I, what I've learned in my own um, just process of uncovering things in my life and growing as a person is trauma is the absence of like a witness to something that was traumatizing in your life. You know, like if you didn't have someone witness you with love or help you feel seen or heard in that moment, it, it, it can be traumatizing. Especially when we're kids. Especially when we're kids. Right. Absolutely. So it's not, you know, there are very you know, serious forms of trauma, but we all have experienced trauma and those aren't any less important to tend to than anything else. But I think for me, one thing that's been really helpful is breath work. Oh, nice. Like really getting into your body, kind of feeling where your emotions are, centering yourself and being grounded and rooted. Mm -hmm. um, but then at night before I go to bed, I write in a journal. Um, it's just, re it's really short, but just a highlight from my day, something I'm grateful for. So nice. I do my gratitude at night and then I'm not as consistent with this, but I'm just doing a meditation, like using the call map or something like that to like, to not let my mind wander into fear and scarcity and uncertainty, but just to keep myself, 
um, reminded of the good things in life and um, the potential that there is out there. So those are a couple of things cool. that I do. Well, bonus material. Thanks, yeah. Skelda. Yeah. So Sean and Kara have a question and then Scott's question. So right. um, we're going to combine the two for today's episode. And Sean and Kara wrote in and said, hello, Garrett. We follow a lot of microeconomic influencers and a common theme has been the talk of a coming cur currency collapse and or a global monetary system collapse and a restructuring of the global monetary structure or a Bretton Woods two agreement. I don't know mm -hmm. what that is. So oh. <laughs> that's, that's new information for me. One thing I've noticed is that nobody talks about cash flow banking and what would happen with the big insurance companies that hold a lot of global wealth in the event of a monetary collapse. Perhaps you can shed some more light on this. Thank you for everything you have built and are doing for people. Wealth Factory has changed mine and my wife's lives forever. So these were nice. members of ours. Um, do you want me to stop at that question before sure, I go into let's, Scott's? Let's start there. So look. I'm concerned about cash. I feel responsible to allocate my cash. Now I'm negotiating on a, on a deal right now on real estate. It's real estate that I'm not like renting out. It's real estate that we're going to utilize and, mm -hmm. you know, put a, a little HQ of one of the companies. Yeah. But ultimately I don't want to be sitting in cash. I I've moved a lot to USDC, which is a stable coin backed by the dollar. People can watch videos on that. I just feel like, mm -hmm. Um, that there is concern, but these concerns for me were greater in 2008. I thought we're in, how do we recover from this? And I mean, yeah, we did a lot of crazy patchwork and there was some serious mm -hmm. ramifications and repercussions. And we've been hearing about this global collapse for a long time. And we're, I think what we're seeing is we're going to move more digital from digital wallets that, you know, maybe universal basic income comes in or digital wallets mm -hmm. where we see places right now, not taking cash right, that we might become cashless and everything's kind of, mm -hmm. which I think tends to give credibility to crypto, which one I couldn't tell you for sure. Yeah, right. Um, but I think that we have to really start looking at how do we acquire assets. Mm -hmm. Assets have a chance to appreciate in value where monetary systems, I think are going to be devalued over the next several years. So um, I'm not as doom and gloom that I think it's all going to be over and that we're going to go to one currency like the Amero or we're going to, you know, all of a sudden, you know, uh, have no value with the dollar. I mean, it's, it's, it's volatile, but nothing like the other volatility we see in the crypto world or, you know, things like that. So I think it's, uh, if we're talking about the life insurance companies, they don't have a lot of money in the stock market, but they still lend money to corporations at a preferred situation. When you're a bond holder, you're basically giving them a debt instrument, which is a bond, right? You're saying, okay. Hey, the company wants money. You're going to lend them money at a specific interest rate. Mm -hmm. And if you hold that to duration and they don't go bankrupt, you know what your interest rate is, right? And if that company does go bankrupt, you are supposed to get paid before the stockholder. So you have a higher priority. That's why there's a lot of times people speculate and think they're going to get more upside potential in an equity position, which is a stock mm -hmm. versus a debt position, which is a bond. Doesn't mean that both can't be completely volatile because when interest rates change, the value of a bond changes. Because mm -hmm. think about it, if you want to sell that bond early, yeah. you might have a 10 year bond and you know, you're getting 5% on that. But if all of a sudden interest rates, you know, go up and it's their 7%, you have to sell your bond at a discount because the interest rate for whoever's buying has to be competitive with the market because they go buy a new bond for 7%. Why do they want to buy your old bond at 5%? Mm -hmm. So you sell it at a lower rate a lower principal amount mm -hmm. to give them the 7%. So you take a, a hit on the principal. So that's where that could be volatile and okay. interest rates are really, really low right now. Mm -hmm. Right? So what if these companies, which I think a lot of companies are going to go out of business in the next seven years because of advancement in technology, because a lot of the big companies are not pleasant to do business with because they've been more in the bully phase than they have been in the creation phase, right? In yeah. the buying up phase rather than the customer service phase. And especially during COVID, a lot of these companies have just used that as an excuse not to perform. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there's not legitimate reasons why that's complicated, but it seems like they lean on that a little heavily. And so if they go out of business, well, that's going to be a problem for insurance companies. Now they're obviously have portfolio managers, but, and, and I'm saying it's less risk than the stock market, but they do face legitimate concern of how secure are these right now? Government bonds, they have the unlimited taxing power to back those up. But at the same time, 
what if <laughs> what if people revolt what if it's you know what if t times are so bad it's hard to collect taxes or, or something like that there's still risk there although that's considered less risk on a government bond than a corporate bond a corporate bond's considered less risk most of the time than a stock but there's also something called junk bonds I don't know how familiar you are with junk bonds. Not at all. But junk bonds are basically a startup or a company that has a lower market capitalization. So let's say they, they're not a blue chip company that's on the Dow or on the S&P 500. They're a much smaller company and they're borrowing funds they, because they haven't been around or proven themselves or have maybe as many reserves. They have to pay a higher interest rate to borrow that money. And okay. so some people gravitate towards that to get the higher interest rate. But because the track record's not there, or maybe this company doesn't know how to manage cash properly, it doesn't guarantee that it's lower risk, mm -hmm. but it's seen as a, as a lower risk to go to a corporate bond of a blue chip versus a startup or a smaller cap company. So just a little background there yeah, on how it sense. works. But, but you gotta realize most insurance general portfolios don't have a lot in the stock market, but they still have a lot with government bonds and corporate bonds and you know, there's, there were mortgage backed securities, if you remember 2008, mm -hmm. that really took a big hit yeah. because mortgages, there was a lot of defaults because there were people doing stated income loans saying, Hey, I make million dollars a year, but they didn't right? just to get this loan. They paid a little higher interest rate. And then when the economy changed and lending tightened up, they were borrowing money to survive. And when that, that bubble happens when we borrow too much money everything starts inflating in price everybody starts getting irrational and we're kind of seeing that in the mortgage market right now mm -hmm. in the in the housing market yeah that the price of property has gone up a lot in especially 2020 even in our area right especially you know people that are exiting california because it's overcrowded yeah. and because they don't love the taxation there mm -hmm. and those kind of things there's a number of reasons why that's happening so yeah it, it, this is just something to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. um, but you also need to understand that life insurance companies have a uh, guarantee association state by state. Okay. So the state what you're does in, that mean? so a guarantee association, like you've heard of FDIC, mm -hmm. right? Which is the federal insurance, which is just our tax dollars. The sticker on securing, the window of every yeah. bank. When like, you oh, go to the we're going to insure a hundred thousand <laughs> or $250,000 of your deposit, right? Mm -hmm. These state associations might do 300,000 and like Utah has never been tapped into. So they do have reserves, but obviously if it was a major meltdown, there's nothing that's going to be totally, you know, secure. There might be things that, you know, there's people that really move towards gold and silver during times of chaos, mm -hmm. or you're seeing more people move towards crypto and there's, there's stable coins that I've even been moving towards at this point, because yeah. I think the other stuff's still highly speculative, even though it's here to stay, which coin's going to make it. Right. You know, we don't know yet. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say in the most oversimplified terms is um, while there is a reasonable concern around, you know, putting your money into um, a big insurance company, it's more stable because of the way that they invest their money. It's Bonds more stable are more, than a mutual fund yes. that's typically heavily in stocks. There's some that are bond related. I don't like bond mutual funds okay. because you have a bucket of bonds that might be traded or sold. And so you don't wait for maturity on a lot of those bonds. Mm -hmm. So if interest rates, you know, change, which interest rates are so low, if you bought a yep. bond right now, there's a high chance that they're going to raise interest rates down the road. Yeah. If they do, you're going to have to sell your bond at a loss Yikes. if you want your money back. Okay. So I'm not a huge fan because interest rates are so low. They're not really giving a big payoff. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the big insurance companies have warranties and they've got guarantee issue bonds where they're buying such a huge amount that they, even though interest rates have changed and gone down, they get a hold on to the higher interest rate bonds. Now that's not on all their bonds, but that kind of helps them with performance overall. Okay. Do you want to uh, tackle the Brenton Woods two agreement? Nah, it's, no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I, it reminds, that just reminds me of college learning about the Brenton Woods agreements and stuff okay. like that. But <laughs> the Brenton Woods two agreement, I'm not researched enough to talk about at this point. Okay. Um, so let's just go into part two, Scott's question. Okay. How will a whole life insurance policy fare in the coming recession depression? I have a policy with about $150,000 in cash value. I currently own five rental properties with positive cash flow. Are there better places, possibly real estate, where I could take a loan against my policy and do better in the coming environment? I'm loaning for my policies right now. I'm moving them to USDC. Mm -hmm. I'm moving them to land that I think is the, the prime areas that I think are gonna go up in value. So um, yeah, I think if he knows real estate and that's part of his investor DNA and he can positively cash flow with that, mm -hmm. now you get the depreciation for tax purposes of the real estate, you get the cash flow from the real estate. 
um, you know, and potential appreciation in value over time from the real estate. Like I'm buying some land right now that that has gone up 8.36% year in and year out for the last 29 years. Wow. And I still feel like there's more room to grow. So, so yeah, I mean, that's great because it's someone that got to use it and it appreciated at that level, which I thought was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still saying, Hey, I'm, I'm willing to do it because I still think it's got more room to grow. There's more potential here. Yep. Okay. So, all right. I think, it, you know, go to billionairesmethod.com. If you haven't read that book, you might have, um, Scott at this point, and that's super helpful or cashflowbanking.com can be helpful as well. And you know, if, if you are watching this and you have questions, you can go to askthemoneynerds.com. Now it doesn't guarantee that we're going to put this on, on video or that your question is going to be specifically answered because it might be very related to someone other question that we've kind of answered, but you'll have someone communicating with you, uh, via email and, and, you know, the more specific you could be, the more detail you can offer. Um, you don't, you could be discreet. You don't have to even share your name if you don't want to, um, on this, but it, what it does is it helps us understand what are people really dealing with? What's happening out there that we can give them practical solutions and answers to. And so it's a little bit easier to do this video than to try to type back and forth, you know, cause I really haven't been, uh, <laughs> haven't been doing any of that on YouTube lately. So responding to comments, yeah. we're a little bit behind on those, but we, we promise to get back to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Turn your thoughts into profits and build the life you love. Want to master your money? Want to figure out the things that you could do to improve your finances? Click here and check out more videos like this on Money Matters.